Hello, so we have an election in the United States coming up pretty soon between Donald Trump and uh, Kamala Harris. And a lot of people will, when they study this election, will probably look at it as sort of a nail in the coffin in terms of American empire. And the reason for that is that the United States has for quite some time existed to teach the world that democracy is the best possible system and that it protects the individual under a system of laws that is both fair and just. And it's quite obvious that whatever we're looking at today, that this system is unable to catapult the best people to the top of the political chain. And that, of course, has consequences for people at the bottom of the chain as well. Because a lot of these people come in with, you know, different kinds of teams. So what, what should we learn? Well, some people, including Kamala Harris, are making comparisons to fascism and to a, a certain German chancellor. Let's, again, remember that you do not end up in these positions instantaneously or overnight. Whoever is being compared to a certain German chancellor or an Italian fascist has had decades in the making to get to a point where that person is normalized. And in almost every case, since we're all human beings, we're not better than the Russians or the Germans um, on, on average as Americans. Quite frankly, we might be worse off considering what those countries had to go through. So you really have to study what is not convenient. You have to study not Donald Trump, but you have to study people in the, in the preceding two decades. So whenever you see a cataclysmic event, you never want to study that event. You want to study what happened over the last 20 years. And, and it just depends on cycles. As clearly, these cycles have shortened because of technology. And so unfortunately, it looks like the United States will be known as the shortest empire in the history of the world, which is what I predicted. And so it may be that the farther back you go, those cycles will be much longer. So you'll have to study quite a bit more data, or maybe not more data, but just you know, more time. So ultimately, number one, never look at the end point. You want to understand something. So you have to do the boring work of studying what went wrong during a, time, during a time period when no one thought anything was wrong, or at least not done enough things were wrong to, to pay attention to. And so, how do you do all of that? It's going to be quite difficult because again, if you, were, if you grew up in the United States like I, I did, you know, you saw the peak. You know, in 1989, 1991, we were talking about, I think, the end of history. That was, again, something where people were discussing the fact that the United States would always be an empire and that it had no competition after the fall of communism. But in fact, where are we now? The Chinese Communist Party is now able to claim credit for the fastest growing middle class uh, in the history of the world. Uh, Vietnam, also a communist country, is doing well. Also, Russia, which I suppose you could consider communist, even though it's more of a petro state. Um, it's also, it's, I guess its finances are better than most countries in the West. So, we're studying all these things. And again, it's not just that one point. It's not just that one person who, to you, in a different era, looks abnormal because you are studying the past from a different vantage point, a more stable vantage point where entropy has not yet hit you. And so when you're studying it, somebody talking about eating cats and dogs is going to look really unusual. And it's gonna be quite obvious to you, future student, that the United States was clearly clearly a terrible place to be that was xenophobic and so on and so forth. That is the wrong conclusion. Completely wrong. Let's put it this way. Um, there are some rules that you can look at. One of them is, is patriotism, too much of it. So you go in, in my neighborhood quite some time ago, uh, I was looking at 
you know, <laughs> some houses had two flags, two American flags. And uh, one in the front, a big one and a small one, um, even farther out front. So you can look at that and say, well, aha, uh -huh. you know, well, now I'm in Singapore, no flags. Uh, in my neighborhood, you can't walk more than a few feet without seeing a house with a flag. They're like, wait a second, I know what the problem was. Too much patriotism. In fact, this is one of the most patriotic countries in the world. So, um, and, but also it's a law. Over here, you cannot fly any other flag except the Singaporean flag. So that might get you down another rabbit hole where you say, okay, you know, and clearly the problem is you can't fly too many flags. In the United States, we had, we had a, quite some time when on national holidays, Mexican, Mexican Independence Day, because the United States is, I don't know, I don't know what the, the geography will look like when you look, when you, if you are, are listening to me now, at whatever point in the future, but you know, United States is next to Mexico. So on Mex Mexican in Independence Day, you have people flying the American flag and the Mexican flag next to each other. Next to each other. So you can say, well, that's the problem. Too many flags, too many languages, blah, blah, blah. That's not it. You, again, have to look for a common fundamental principle. And if you're smart, you should be able to figure, figure, it, figure it out by now, but you won't because if you're studying this in the future, again, you're not yet at a point where you need to dig that deep. You're in a very stable place. There's no need for you, for you to think that deep. But the answer is, you know, anything that's excessive, anything that's not compatible with equilibrium. So it's not that Singapore is successful because they don't let people fly the Malaysian flag. Malaysia is a country that is above Singapore. Again, a neighbor opposite situation as the United States in terms of respect for, an, for a neighboring flag. Um, that's not it. <laughs> Again, the, the issue is you have a system that over here is very much successful because it is designed to avoid anything excessive. So in Singapore today, which is, has not yet hit entropy, it's very successful. And by the way, lots of immigrants, all those guys that just walked by me are probably from Bangladesh or working on this construction here. So if you're in the United States, you're gonna see, you're gonna hear a lot about immigration. Oh, these people are coming in. And you heard a lot about the Poles, Polish immigration coming into the EU, low cost labor. It's the same thing over and over again. Singapore is quite successful. It's not the immigration. It's again, the ex anything that's excessive. But the immigration makes it really easy because again, if you're looking at that endpoint, something that looks abnormal to you, you're not, you're not, you haven't learned how to think. By the way, immigrants only go to places that are successful because typically there's a, an issue with the currency. See, why would you leave your hometown? There has to be a reason, and almost always that reason, reason unless it's by force or war, is going to be because the country that you're going to has a better economy or a better financial system. So, again, you want to look for something that is universal. You have to train yourself to do that and actually avoid what is what you see or so I suppose the most obvious example. And almost always, because human beings are visual, it's going to be those people who look different than us, who have a different color or a different religion or a different belief system. Now, again, there's a documentary on Netflix, a streaming service online that shows videos that I've, I'm looking at is finished. It's about uh, Osho or Bagwan in a small town called Antelope, Oregon. And they basically came in from India and what was a ghost town, they rebuilt the whole thing. And it was fine for a while until it wasn't. So again, you can go ahead and look at that to see that no matter what, the issue is always, you know, immigrants have always provided a short-term boost. And then when it gets to the difficult part of assimilation and immigration, sorry, assimilation and, um, just sort of cooperation and understanding people that are new and different. That's the hard part, right? And that's the part nobody wants to do. But the other lesson is when things get tough, you need some prosperity to convince people to do the hard work or just to do any kind of hard work. So why are people working so hard? Why are those Bangladeshis walking at 7 p.m. 
at night, taking public transportation, still wearing their uniform. Why is an immigrant worker still there behind me making sure that people are able to, to you know, cross safely? Why has he left his hometown somewhere thousands of miles away to do that? Because there was an element of prosperity here that probably did not exist in his hometown. So when you are prosperous, that's the opportunity, the time that you get to understand who that person is. Now, am I gonna to talk to him? No, he's busy, he's working. So there has to be a civil institution. We call this, or we used to call it in the United States, journalism. Somebody would actually go in, make sure who somebody who was trusted and therefore independent, would talk to him, figure out well, what is it that you need? You know, what are you looking for? And so on and so forth. And uh, he's walking behind me. It's like he's got a massive uh, flashlight that he's carrying. So you see these guys everywhere here. And again, if this society were breaking down, the first thing you would do or you're unemployed, you would say, what is this different looking person doing? But again, this is now the probably the most prosperous country in the world. So at the same time that the United States is complaining about immigration, <laughs> and that's the cause of their problems, I'm here and we just passed by. I just passed by more immigrants than non-immigrants, okay? And again, as the United States is, is, is failing, clearly, you know, you have to look at what is universal. What is universal is not that immigration causes problems, it's that any prosperous country attracts immig immigrants, particularly from poor places, and they only have a few years to assimilate those immigrants, um, or at least, you know, you can't predict economic cycles, so maybe it's not a few years, depending on where you, when, when they come in, you don't have that much time to understand each other. So, I always said that I, I'm uniquely suited to write the obituary of the United States of America. And one of the problems will be that anybody who does it that's not me is going to look at this and just blame Donald Trump. And that's terrible. It's weak, it's lazy, because you don't understand that Donald Trump is the consequence of 20 to 30 years of arrogance. When the Soviet Union fell in 1991 or 1989, the United States had no competition. So, it told the whole world, we succeeded because of democracy. Actually, they succeeded in, in having no competition based on espionage. <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, an interesting situation. That's not the only reason they did it, right? But they managed to basically uh, attract a lot of people over to the United States who did not necessarily want to be a part of a less lucrative, more cooperative system. And so, you know, you've got a very interesting situation overall where the Soviet Union actually managed to build a lot of things, trains, escalators, that when I visited in 2015 to 2016, quite some time after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, those, they were still using Soviet era infrastructure. And if you look at the Soviet flag, it's got a hammer and a sickle, right? It's farmers and construction workers, and they, except for the farming part, didn't do that very well. So, you're looking around for quite some time, between 19, 1989 and 2001, no competition. We're talking about the end of history. And obviously, when you have no competition, you can say anything and do anything, and nobody will contradict you. So, it's, so, the second possible universal rule is that it's good to have competition. I don't care where you are, you want competition. That is actually the point of a democratic system, is that you're able to have competition and therefore alert each other to issues that you might not, might not otherwise discover on your own. But in the United States, when societies fail, sorry, this is the other issue. American society is doing well. People are, they got money, have a lot of debt, but they have money. You know, no one's sort of, you know, riding in the streets yet. So when I say, I should say not a societal failure, a political failure, failure, which portends eventual societal decline. The extent of that decline really just depends on, you know, how people cope in the United States and how successful and how quickly the other competitors rise up and whether or not they want to cooperate with the United States as it, as it goes down and other countries go up. So you can see overall, that what you really want to do if you're in a political system is be friends with each other, but compete. 
steps. In other words, you're working towards the same, towards the same goal. But it's also the case you want to try to do that on a global scale. So if you can, obviously that's quite difficult. But that's why we've got the United Nations. We're trying to get there. And I don't know what system in place you have for resolving conflicts, cross-border conflicts uh, in the future, but hopefully it'll be better than what we had now because it's, it's, not, it's not doing really well in terms, of its, in terms of this issue of resolving conflicts. But ironic because I'm here in Singapore, which is one of the most um, heavily diplomatic countries in the world. It really does rely on diplomacy because it's so small. Uh, so I want to study the election. It doesn't matter who, who wins. Um, most likely it will be Donald Trump. But again, it doesn't matter if the other side wins. There's so much debt. And this, this is something we knew about quite some time ago. If a national government, was, the budget was essentially an autopilot, like two thirds of the budget was going into vested interests or long-term defense contracts. So another, if you're studying the United States, uh, this era, the other thing you wanna do is be careful when people tell you that they're special and they deserve more government benefits than, any, than everybody else. Be careful when you're studying an outpost that is not national, that is local, and you're told, well, the reason is anything other than sort of physical decline. And you're told, well, we're special, we deserve better benefits and so on and so forth. Shorter working hours than everybody else. Because what ends up happening is they become a vested political group, a vested political interest, and they're able to either and, and at that point because the, the there's no principle by the way in humanity that says i'm special that doesn't work that way to the extent that you think that you're exceptional that you're special that your culture is special and exceptional you right, right away stop yourself because you failed because all societies gravitate towards entropy all of them even the united states which was protected for quite some time by two massive oceans and so in other words, it had the perfect, you want to talk about a perfect sort of background? It was the United States. So whatever, wherever you are now studying this, we're not, probably not going to come up with a, better, a more perfect background situation than the United States. Lots of natural resources, lots of land, smaller population, relatively small population, uh, protected by two oceans, relatively friendly neighbors. Um, it's Mexico was so prosperous that Napoleon, I think Napoleon III, actually dumped Louisiana on the Americans because he wanted to focus on Mexico. It had better farmland, better climate, and so on and so forth. So anyway, the other the problem with thinking that you're special or claiming that you have some sort of excep exceptionalism, which is what I heard a lot in the, two, in the you know, before 2001, is that you can't export it. You can't replicate something that's exceptional. <laughs> something that is exceptional is an exception. So, <laughs> so you can't really, probably can't even regulate something like that, right? Gotta let it fly. So if you ever get to the point where you're thinking that you're exceptional or your system is exceptional, number one, even if you as an individual are exceptional, it doesn't mean the bomb that comes out of somewhere or the terrorist bomb that comes out of somewhere, you know, whether from the sky or from a neighbor, it doesn't, or from just a poorly regulate, regulated transportation system, or a car hits you or something, it doesn't mean that you're not subject to the same problems as everyone, as everyone else around you. But the other real issue is that, you know, if the whole point is you want to have something to export, and that's what the United States was doing with democracy, was trying to export democracy. And clearly, it's not going to be able to do that anymore, um, given these two candidates, which again, are deeply flawed, but are not the reason for the decline of the United States. Uh, again, we're not gonna see those kinds of people in Singapore because Singapore, you know, there's nobody to, there are no circumstances in Singapore that necessitate that kind of rough sort of rock and roll style and so because we're all human beings that's the lesson if you're ever in a country where the politicians are telling you 
that they're exceptional or that this culture is exceptional, immediately a light bulb should go off in your head that you're not dealing with somebody that understands human nature. Because again, the Americans, it turns out, are not better than the Germans. We're not better than the Russians. We're not better than the Italians. We're all definitely, we'll probably soon tell ourselves we'll be able, be able to admit to ourselves that we're not better than the Chinese. Singapore, again, the most prosperous country in the world right now, not because <laughs> it just happens to have majority Chinese population. So there's already evidence that people in the future will probably say, well, Confucian values are what make us great, or the Chinese genes are what make us great. Again, someone says that, they may be very smart, but so were the slaveholders in the United States back in the day who really believed in white superiority. So the reason it doesn't work, because every system is, is composed of human beings and human beings are all struggling to find a system that they can export, not just overseas, but to the next generation. So if you can't export your system, in other words, your civil institutions, your culture that underlines those institutions, your society will fail. And it will fail because somebody, perhaps named Donald Trump or Elon Musk, will come in and say, this is inefficient. And not only is it inefficient, when I point out that it's inefficient, it's not working, you attack me. And that just gives me an incentive. The extent that I have money or have been funding the opposing political party for quite some time, which is what Donald Trump was doing as a real estate tycoon, I can get involved and try to fix things. And so that is what's happening now in the United States. That should be a fairly good summary. Um, if you're looking at this in the future, remember, by the time your history books, at least the ones now, they're all about, look at the fire, look at the riots. Even in Singapore, there's a movie called 1965. And the whole basis of that movie, the central plot, are racial riots. So, <laughs> and again, that's not what makes Singapore great. It's what, you know, negotiating the water deal, water rights with Malaysia, all those things you don't think about. That's what you want to study. Having the right leadership, driving out the Chinese triads, a criminal organization, passing the right laws, and definitely the ability to reverse course when you don't see success, successful policies working, that's actually key. The other thing you want to look at, and the reason you don't want to think that you're exceptional or that your people are exceptional, uh, traffic control, is again, because you want to have a system that you can examine that works and also to get feedback that's legitimate so that you can fix problems when they come up so that you're not left with all these different fiefdoms trying to create problems. And in fact, one, one hypothesis for the United States might just be that it failed just like the Soviet Union failed. All these, the Soviet Union allegedly, we don't know if any of this information is true because history is written by the victors and they like to lie about their enemies, that the outposts of the Soviet Union were not sending back accurate information to Moscow, the capital, the headquarters because they were afraid of retribution or punishment or so on and so forth. Well, in the United States, something similar is happening because you have a national government that is just spending money. Um, California next year, well, just that one state, will have a budget deficit of 45, 46 billion dollars. And that's a lot of money. Um, I don't know how much, there's a lot of money with, with wherever it is that you're looking at, but this is a lot of money. So. You know, how does it get that to, to that point? Again, it's not that, that California is covering up a lot of different things, though it, it is as, as well. It's that you have a system that is just not sustainable and that also has no incentive to tell the national government to change it. And that's happening all over the world, right? That feedback between the government officials and the people, which was supposed to be made easier by having local officials on the ground in a large geographic area communicate rather than a direct feedback system has failed. Basically the same, a similar phenomenon as the Soviet Union, where the headquarters wasn't really able to figure out what was going on in the outposts. So the other thing you want to look at, if you're trying to figure out how to sustain your country, 
you're not going to be listening to this unless you're part of a place that is still interested in, in some sort of stability and not entropy. <sighs> you have to try to figure out how to avoid entropy. And then to do that, you need communication. You need to figure out, again, how you're not exceptional. How you're just, just another part of the human fabric throughout time. Throughout time. You do that, at least, uh, at least you won't be the shortest empire in the history of the world, like the United States. <laughs>